Bite of the Mango, Chapter 1. My name is Mariatu, and this is my story. It begins the year I was 11, living with my aunt and uncle and cousins in a small village in Sierra Leone. I lived with my father, Sister Marie, and her husband, Ali, since I was a baby. I called them Ya for mother, Pa for father, as terms of endearment. It was common in my country for children in the rural areas to be raised by people other than their birth parents. Our village of Magbaru was small, like most villages in Sierra Leone, with about 200 people living there. There were eight houses in the village, made out of clay. The wood and tin roofs, several families lived in each house. The adults slept in the smaller rooms, and we kids usually slept together in the living room which we called the parlor. Everyone chipped in and helped each other out. The women would all cook together. The men would fix the roofs and houses together and we kids played together. None of the kids in my village went to school. My family, like everyone else in Megbrew, was very poor. We need you to help us with the chores on the farm, Maria explained. Occasionally, children from wealthier families and villages would pass through Megbrew on their way to and from school. Some of these children went to boarding schools in Sierra Leone's capital city, Freetown. I felt sad when I saw them. I wish I could see for myself what a big city looked like. Starting from the time I was about seven and strong enough to carry plastic jugs of water or straw baskets full of corn on my head, I spent my mornings planting and harvesting food on our farm outside Magbaru. No one owned land in the villages we all shared the farm every four years or so we rotated the crops of cassava which is like a potato peanuts rice peppers and sweet potatoes even though not everybody who lived in marie and ali's house was related by blood we thought of each other as family calling one another uncle aunt and cousin muhammad and ibrahim Two of my cousins were already living in the village when I arrived as a baby. Muhammad was about 17. I was entirely sure. Since people in the village didn't celebrate birthdays or keep track of how old they were, Muhammad was chubby with a soft face and warm eyes. He was always trying to make people laugh, even at funerals. Everybody would stay home and mourn while someone in the village died, usually for three days. We didn't work during that time. We sat around and the adults would cry, but Muhammad would walk in and start making light of everyone's tears. If the dead hear you making such a scene, he would say, they'll come marching back here and ghosts and take over your bodies. People would look shocked and Muhammad would then speak more gently. Really? He would say, the dead died because it was their time. They wouldn't want you spending your remaining days here on earth crying about them. Muhammad was a good person. When food was scarce, he'd give his portion to me or the other younger kids saying, you eat up because you're little and need to grow. Ibrahim couldn't have been more different. He was about a year older than Muhammad, tall and thin. Ibrahim was bossy. When we worked at the farm, he was always telling me and the smaller kids what to do. If we didn't obey him, he'd kick a shovel or pail or just storm off. Ibram had these episodes in which his body would convulse, his eyes would get glossy, and his mouth would froth. Much later, when I moved to North America, I discovered that the disease he had is called epilepsy. Meguru was a lively place, with goats and chickens running about and underfoot. In the afternoons, I played hide-and-seek with my cousins and friends, including another girl named Mariatu. Mariatu and I were close from the moment we met. We thought having the same name was so funny, and we laughed about lots of other things, too. The very first year we were old enough to farm, Mariatu and I pleaded with our families to let us plant our crops beside each other so that we wouldn't be separated. We spent our nights dancing to the sound of drums and to people singing at least once a week. The entire village met to watch as people put a performance 
When it was my turn to participate, I'd played the devil, dressed up in a fancy red and black costume. After I danced for a while, I'd chase people around and try to scare them, just like the devil does. I didn't see my parents often, but when I was 10, I went to visit them in Yonkro, the village where they lived. One evening after dinner, as we sat out under the open sky, my dad told me about my life before I went to live with his older sister. The stars and the moon were shining. I could hear the crickets rubbing their long legs together in the bushes, and the aroma of our dinner of hot peppers, rice, and chicken lingered in the air. The day you were born was a lucky day, my dad said, sucking a long pipe filled with tobacco. You were born in hospital, he continued, which I knew was very unusual in our village. Your mother smoked cigarettes, lots of cigarettes, and just before you were about to come out, she got cramps and began to bleed. If you hadn't been in the hospital where the nurses gave you some medicine to fix your eyes, you would have been blind. I shivered for a moment, thinking of what life would be would be like then. It was rainy and cold on the day I was born. My dad then told me, that's a lucky sign, he said. It's good to be married or have a baby on a rainy day. For a living, my dad hunted for bushmeat, which he sold at the market in a nearby town alongside the villagers' harvests. It seemed he wasn't a very good hunter, though, because I knew from Murray that he didn't make much money at it. I knew, too, that he was just always getting into trouble going in and out of jail. The jail was a cage with wooden bars set in the middle of the village so everyone could peer in at the criminal. In Sierra Leone, girls spend most of their time with women and other girls, not with their fathers, grandfathers, or uncles. It was nice to be talking to my dad in this way, and I listened carefully as he explained how I come to be living with Marie and Ellie. My dad had married two women, as many men do in Sierra Leone. Sampa was his older wife. Amini Natu, my mother, was the younger one. Before I was born, Sampa had given two, two boys. Both of them died within a year of coming into the world. When Sampa was pregnant the third time, my dad asked if Marie should, would, if she would take the ch- child. That way, he hoped the child would live. Santanji, my half-brother, was born three years before me. Soon after Santanji went to live with Marie, my mom became pregnant with my older sister. Sampa didn't like that. She was a jealous woman who wanted all my father's attention. So when my sister was born, Sampa sweetly asked my dad to bring Santanji back to live with them. Marie was my dad's favorite sister. At first, he told me he didn't want to bring Santanji home because he knew it would upset her. But eventually he did. As Sampa's sweetness turned sour, she fought with my dad until Santa G moved back in with them. Marie was very sad about it. Wanting to make both Marie and my dad happy, my mom told Marie she could raise the child she was expecting. I don't know whether this child will be a boy or a girl, my mother told her. But I promise that you can keep the child forever and ever and call him or her your own. I went to live with Marie as soon as I had been weaned out of my mother's milk for some reason that even my dad forgot. Sampa and Ta- Santanji back to Marie when I was about three. My half-brother and I became very close. We slept side by side on straw mats, ate from the same big plate of food, and washed each other's backs in the river. When we were older, we teased each other endlessly, but three years later, Sampa decided she wanted Santanji back again. He didn't want to go, and I didn't want him to leave either, but Marie and I had to take him back to his mother. By then, Sampa and my mom were so jealous of each other that they'd have big fights. It was hard to understand what they were arguing about since they spoke so fast and so loud, but they'd pull each other's hair and spit and kick. When this happened in the house, Santa G and I crept so far back that our spines were flush against the wall, our eyes would be wide open, staring and we'd cover our mouths with our hands to stop ourselves from laughing out loud. Two grown women fighting, with their eyes flashing. 
their bosoms flying and their dresses pulled up to their waists was a funny sight. When I saw how Sampa and my mom fought, I was happy that Marie was raising me. I only wish she could raise Santa G too. A few months after Marie and I returned to Megburu, someone sent word that Santa G was sick. His belly stuck out like he, like a pregnant woman. We heard he was so weak he couldn't even get out of bed. The medicine woman gave him all sorts of remedies, but nothing helped. And this time, my dad told me he didn't have enough money for a hospital. Santa G died at home in the middle of the night. A strange thing happened to me after Santa G's death. As I was walking one day, I thought I could hear his voice calling me. I turned to look, but there was no one there. This happened several times over the next year. I often wondered in the times that were to come if Santa G was a spirit watching over me. The evening my dad told me about my early childhood, he stopped talking as some of the village children began to sing and the drum in the center. This was the evening the townsfolk of Yonkro met to sing and dance, share stories and gossip, just like every one did every week in Megmaru. Thank you, I whispered to my father. He nodded his head in response, I stood up, and I went back into the hut to join the others. A damsy was Marie's youngest daughter. She had gone to live with my grandmother when she was very small, and she came back to stay with us when I was about seven, and a damsy was ten. That's when I began to understand a little bit of why my mother and Sampo were so jealous of each other. I got angry when Marie gave a damsy new clothes or extra food to eat. I would yell at Marie, Seize your own child and you like her better. My aunt would say, that's not true. If I continued to complain, Marie would lose her patience and pull out a, a tamlaga, or what we call a whipping stick, made of a long, thick weed that grows everywhere. Don't say such things, she would ad- admonish me, slapping by behind with it. It's not true. Despite my jealousy, I liked having a sister, and the damsy was nice even when I was mean to her. She'd give me extra food sometimes, and she helped me sew up my skirts when I ripped them plain. The same year I went to visit my parents, I learned that a friend of Ellie's wanted to marry me. The man's name was Salu. He didn't live in our village, but he had relatives who did, so he visited often. One day, he walked right up to me while I was playing a game with some other kids. He stood so close I could feel his hot breath on my cheek. When you grow up, I will be your husband, he announced. I was scared. When Salu pulled away, I ran and found a damsy. What does this old man want with me? I asked her. Maybe he wants to kiss you, she said, laughing. Ugh, how awful. A damsy joked around, saying things could be worse. You could be married off to Abu. We giggled, thinking of old widower in Meg Baru who spent his days sitting in the shade beside his hut, staring around at the ground. A damsy and I made up a game after that. We went through all the men in Meg Baru and matched them up with all the young girls. I paired a damsy with the village chairman, who was like the mayor of Meg Baru, a tall, skinny, older man who already had a big family. A few days after he'd accosted me, Salu and his parents came to have a chat with Marie and Ellie. Adamsi and I were ordered outside to play, even though it was late and we had to get up early to work on the farm the next day. We crouched underneath the window and craned our necks to hear. Went, but, but we couldn't because everyone inside was speaking softly. The next morning, Marie pulled me aside while we were planting sweet potatoes and said Salier wanted me to be his second wife. The marriage would be in a few years, she said, matter-of-factly. I don't want to marry Salier, I told Marie. But he's my husband's friend, Mariatu, she said, stopping her planting to look at me sternly. If you don't find anyone else, you will marry him. Before long, I discovered I did have feelings for someone else. Musa was a sweet boy, just a year or two older than me, 
who lived in a nearby village. From the time we were little, he and I would see each other during planting, since his family shared our farm. We would also come to our village with his family at night to sing and dance. One afternoon, Musa and I stopped our digging, sat down beside each other, and talked. We gossiped about the other kids. Then we went swimming in the river and splashed each other. Afterwards, we sat alongside the river, dangling our toes in the cool water. This soon became our routine. We'd stop our work early, talk, then swim, and then talk some more. I liked being around Musa. My entire body felt warm. One day, Musa took my hand and said that when we were older, we would get married and have children together. Afterwards, I told Marie, Musa's father is a rich man, she snapped. He's not going to let his son marry a poor girl. My stomach churned. I held my words inside. For in Sierra Leone, children were taught never to disobey their elders. But when I went to sleep that night, I cried. I hid my face as well as I could so a damsy wouldn't see my tears. I saw Musa the next day at the farm, and I smiled when he looked at me. When his father sees how happy we both are, then he'll say yes to our marriage, I told myself. I remembered what my dad had said about me being lucky. Maybe this will be another time when I am lucky, I thought. But then the rebels invaded our lives and everything changed. It all started during the dry season when I was 11. War had come to Sierra Leone, and our chairman heard that the violent rebels were destroying villages and killing people in eastern Sierra Leone. We were headed toward Magburu. The rebels wanted to overthrow the government, which they accused of being corrupt and not helping the people. The rebels were being the the rebels were from different tribes across Sierra Leone including Temne, like us, and I couldn't understand why they wanted to kill poor people or take over our villages. Eat all our food and sleep in our houses, but apparently they did. Whenever we heard a rumor that the rebels were close, the chairman would order all of the villagers in Magbrew to flee into the bush. The first time it happened, we abandoned our, our homes and took nothing with us, hiding in the bush for several days as we listened to our stomachs moan in hunger. After we returned safely to the village, Marie and Ali came up with a plan. They filled empty rice bags with dry vegetables and, ca- and cassava. We all stuffed a change of clothes and some bedding into the bags, too. From then on, whenever the chairman said the rebels were on their way again, we would grab our bags and walk into the bush in single file following a lead. After a while, the hiding began to seem normal. We would spread our straw mats in a forest clearing and stay there, sometimes for as long as a month. I wasn't really scared at first. We kids continued with the games we played back in the village. We'd sing and call out to each other around the fire at night. We would tell stories and share what we had heard about the war. We would lie on our backs and stare up at the moon and stars. I remembered, though, that long ago my father had told me never to count the stars. If you do and you land on the star that is you, you will die, he said. I wasn't quite sure what he meant, but I knew I wasn't going to die. As the rumors about the rebels grew more frequent, we had to keep quieter during the our time in the bush. We stopped cooking our food so the rebels wouldn't see the smoke from the fires, and sometimes all we ate for an entire day was raw cassava, which is very hard and dry and blunt. Everybody talked in whispers. Chills ran through me whenever I heard a noise such as a twig breaking in the bush behind the clearing. A few times I overheard the adults talking. They were saying that the rebels didn't just kill people, they tortured them. I didn't want a lot. I didn't talk a lot in the forest after that. We were in hiding. Ibrahim would often stay right beside me, making sure I was safe. During these times, I didn't mind him being bossy. When reports of rebels came during the dry season of the next year, the chairman decided we should all go to another village, Marnama. 
There are lots of people in Manarma, he told us when we had gathered to listen to his instructions. We will be safer there than here in the forest. The day my family left for Manarma seemed to be no different from any other time we fled the village. We would go back to our regular lives as soon as the chairman said it was safe to return. But this time, things would not work out that way.